This is episode number one with Dane Bergman. Welcome to the Quarter Life Comeback Podcast, the show that empowers you to become the hero of your journey from 25 to life. I'm your host, Brian Tier. Now let the comeback begin. Hey guys, welcome back to the Quarter Life Comeback. I've got a question for you real quick. Have you or someone you know ever said, I wish I could travel full time? I know I have. Well, today I'm really excited to be interviewing someone who's doing exactly that. I first came across Dane Bergman via social media. Um, I think it was Twitter. We were both online personal trainers at the time. And we've pretty much chatted ever since. Um, Now, Dane's still in his 20s, but for over 10 years, he's been traveling the world, um, working along the way, and living life on his own terms, pretty much. Um, He runs a blog called The Lifestyle Empire, where he inspires other people to do the same, and also shares tips for things like, you know, making money on the road, how to pack um, for long-term travel, um, and just how to enjoy your experience that much more. Now, in this episode, which I'm really, really keen for you guys to listen to, you're going to learn how Dane got into traveling and his first memorable experience, some common misconceptions about traveling full-time, and a a big one that I ask him about in the show, how you can know if long-term travel is for you and how to get started, some tips for making money on the road, Uh, hint, it's not as difficult as you think. The best place he's ever been. Three of the craziest things he's done. And you guys are not going to want to miss these. Um, I had no idea myself. And then the biggest lesson Dane's learned from his time on the road. All right, let's go hang out with Dane. Dane, how's it going? Not too bad, Brian. Yourself, mate? Cool, cool, cool. I'm good, thanks. Now, guys, I told you a bit about uh, how Dane and I met, but... This guy is the real deal when it comes to traveling full time, uh, working on the road and that sort of thing. So, Dane, just set the scene for us right now. Tell people where you are right now and the day you've had. Alrighty, mate. Well, um, I've actually just had an epic day. Like, it's it's definitely been my best day in Sri Lanka so far. And, you know, up there with some of the best days in all my my travels, let alone my life. But I'm currently in a in a town just north of Kandy, in the center of Sri Lanka. And um, I went off today on a, on a safari to Kuladala National Park, and we didn't really know what to expect when we, when we booked a safari and with my, uh, my mate Jacob, who I met in Colombo. But um, yeah, basically it's three and a half hours, four-wheel driving, standing out over the rooftop, and just driving through a whole bunch of wetlands in the search of um, for Asian elephants. And yeah. sure enough, after an hour or so, we got re- rained on, and we saw like a beautiful amount of... Uh, of wildlife and birds and everything like that. But then this huge herd of, uh, of elephants just came out of the bushes and there was probably uh, maybe close to 25 or 30 of them, little ones, big ones. And we got to spend probably half an hour just within like three or four meters of these elephants. So it was absolutely oh. phenomenal. And, you know, three hours there, one hour just finding elephants like all through the place. And it's just, it was mind blowing. It was such a good experience to, uh, to, to be a part of and to share it with some, with a good friend as well. Yeah, a friend of mine uh, went to Sri Lanka not so long ago, and he said it was one of the best places he's ever been. It's not; it's still, still really untouched compared to places like Thailand or Bali, where it's becoming sort of more commercial and that sort of thing. But he said, yeah, Sri Lanka was right up there. Yeah, man, I can't agree more. It's just, it is. It's very unique in its own way. And one thing that's really stood out to me as well is, um, is the the local people. They're just they're so fantastic and they're they're so friendly. And, you know. Sometimes when you get to the big tourist meccas like Bali and Kuta and, you know, certain parts of Southeast Asia, you can sort of get this, you know, sort of like a fake feeling sometimes, like maybe they're just helping you out because they want a little bit of money or, you know, and yeah. sometimes that's <laughs> not the case, but, you know, a lot of the times it is. But, you know, so far in Sri Lanka, it's, people are so genuine. They come up to you and they're, they're actually interested in what you're doing, where you're from, even if it's just pointing you in the right direction of the bus or showing you where the toilet is or giving you their room to sleep in. Like, they're, they're just, they're so nice. They're so friendly. They're so happy. And it's, yeah, it's definitely fantastic. One of my favorite countries so far. Yeah, just genuine human connection. Exactly, mate. Cool. So, Dan, um, I ask all my guests this um, 
kind of as a as a kickstarter for the interviews but why don't you just let let listeners know um how because obviously you were a personal trainer as well um but how did optimal living and healthy living and all that good stuff become a part of your life yeah well i guess uh, growing up you know i'm from a, a family of four four brothers so it's always been we've always been pretty active competitive playing sport like growing up playing afl and cricket and running and pretty much anything we could get our our hands on and then mum would be willing to drive us to but um basically when i got into my uh you know, later teens, I sort of got interested in working out in the gym and doing stuff to improve my athletic performance. But uh, beyond that, um, you know, I, I really wanted to – I was helping my friends, you know. They wanted to, a gym program or, or some advice on what to do to improve their their, their strength or their, their power output for football. And so I sort of found myself naturally just – uh, wanting to learn more, not only to for my own interest, but you know to help to help my friends and help my, uh, you know anyone that sort of was willing to ask, I guess. So um, uh, yeah, that was sort of how I guess drifted into it. But then um, about six years ago, my my dad got uh, sick. He got pulmonary fibrosis, which is a degenerative disease of the heart and lungs. And um, unfortunately, he passed away only two or three days after I sort of got the call to come back from Canada. So that really sort of um, brought more of a, a personal issue to it, I guess, or a personal response mm-hmm. on my behalf to really want to get in there and help people live a healthier, optimal life to to prevent before the even uh, before the onset of degenerative diseases can start. So, yeah, yeah. I, I enrolled in a, a personal training course and you know furthered my knowledge and got more of an in-depth understanding rather than just being one of the guys at the gym. And um, yeah, it was fantastic. And from there, I haven't really haven't really looked back and just enjoyed you know, helping people out and showing people and also learning more as I go along as well. Yeah. So I'm quite excited for this interview and um, I'm sure the listeners will be too because we're going to talk not really about optimal living as such, but just living a kick-ass, you know, extraordinary, extraordinary life. Um, yeah, man, that's the way to do it. Exactly. And you are a prime example Um I wonder if you could just go into how you got into traveling because if you guys are listening, Dane is pretty much, he's still in his 20s and he's been traveling for what, 10 plus years now? Yeah, just coming up to 10 years. So pretty much your entire adult life, um, Mm -hmm. you've been traveling, working on the road. How did you get into it and um, what was your first sort uh, sort of fond memory of traveling? Yeah, well, I guess um, at 18, I sort of, you know, I didn't really feel ready to enroll in university, didn't know what I wanted to do. So I just thought of the next best thing was to move uh, from Melbourne up to up to Darwin, and that's in the north of Australia, for anyone that doesn't know. And basically, it was um, just for pure interest to get up there, because I actually grew up in the, in the top end of Australia, and also my dad was up there, so I wanted to be a little bit uh, closer to him, if you will. And so that was my first sort of experience of... Uh, um, you know, heading off by myself. But I sort of travelled around Australia for the first three years just playing football and, and, and meeting people. But a guy in particular, um, Afro, we we call him, but his name is actually Chris Atkins. And he was about 10 years older than me. And he was um, he, he was a pretty well-travelled guy. He'd been through um, like Canada, North America, South America, Southeast Asia. And he used to just always have these amazing stories. And I was always so intrigued by what he did. And, you know, I always looked up to him a bit as a as a role model as well. So, his story sort of rubbed off in me and I thought, yeah, you know, there's this whole other world. I got to, I got to get out and explore it and see what, Mm. you know, what's there. So in 2007, I headed off to the nice and safe area of, uh, of Southeast Asia, you know, which is pretty much a backpacker's dream. You know, you you can do, you can do anything there. It's that easy. And, um, yeah, so Thailand was my, was my first experience for a month and it was yeah, brilliant, really opened up my eyes and I haven't, Mm. haven't really looked back ever since then. Yeah, that was that was my first taste of of real sort of traveling. I mean, I'd done family holidays and things while I was at school, but traveling uh, with a group of friends was my first real taste as uh, going to Thailand. And I also had the same the same thing. It's like we grew up in a in our small world. Um, not saying that in like a derogatory way or anything, but in our little um, little neighborhoods or whatever you want yeah, to call it. Yeah, little bubble issue, yeah. And I realized then there's so much to see and do beyond beyond our immediate surroundings. And, and I mean, this the world is full of beautiful places and things to do. So um, I want to touch on, you wrote, and if you guys are listening, Dane writes a really cool blog, uh, The Lifestyle Empire, where he encourages other people to do this type of thing. But 
you wrote a really cool article, um, which is still up on the homepage. I think it's the latest one you've written. And it's called, um, Does Traveling Mean You're Running From Something? If I, if I got that right. Yep, yep, now that's the one. And uh, basically you touch on, you know, common responses to people when you tell them that you've been traveling for so long. I wonder if you could just go into some of those and I'll link to the article in the show notes, but if you could uh, link to some of the common responses you get when you tell people you've been traveling for 10 years and you know, you don't plan to settle down anytime soon. And especially that, that question of, um, you know, what are you running from? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, I, I can just picture people's faces when they hear that I've been traveling for, for 10 years and, you know, they're sort of the eyes widen and then sort of the muse look comes up and they're, they're like, what? Like, you know, so many different questions. But in the article, I, I won't go into too much detail. You can always uh, go on a read. But pretty much, um, you know, there's sort of three responses that sort of come back that are the most popular. And the first one sort of maybe a bit along the lines of admirations and it's sort of like, you know, uh, what's your favorite place and where are you going next and where do you recommend and, you know, all these fantastic questions and, you know, we always have a great conversation and these people are normally genuinely interested in traveling themselves and they, you know, they can't wait to get out or they've been once and they want to go again. So yeah. that's sort of the, you know, the first response you get and it's always a really good one because, you know, for the next hour you guys are pretty much just best mates and talking about all the different traveling you want to do, yeah. which is fantastic. Uh, the next, the next response we sort of get you know is you've probably had this one a few times as yourself but it's um sometimes from people you know a little bit better and everything like that and these questions might be uh you know your travels are fantastic they sound awesome um but you know when when do you think you're going to grow up or when are you going to get a real job or you know, <laughs> something something along those lines which which is fine you know I, I ask myself that sometimes as well but but um yeah you know it's it's always it's always good. It's a fun conversation after that as well. But and also, you know, do I miss my family and, and everything? And you know, the the common sense answer is, of course, of you know, of course, I miss my family and my brothers and my mom and uh, everything like that. But you know, I don't think that it's a uh, it's it's a negative aspect. You know, the times you do get to spend with with my family are fantastic. I've just come back from mm -hmm. Australia. And it was uh, it was a brilliant week, and you know, it's, it makes the times you are together that much more more special, if you will. I love how exactly. you say you've just come back from Australia <laughs> and rather than saying I just went back. Like it's, it's kind of like saying that it's, it's not really home. It's just. Yeah. Well, it's, it hasn't been like, <laughs> I, spent, I think a year and a half in Australia in the last seven or eight years or seven years, I think. So it's, it's, it's always going to be home, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it yeah. feels like I'm going on a, on a holiday there, which is, it's cool. It's a great place. Great, great place. So. I know when I talk to people about the possibility of traveling for anything longer than a couple of weeks, um, a common response I get is, uh, you know, something like, um, well, that's only a finite thing. And like, what are you going to do when you get back? Or like, you know, when you come back, then you, you've got nothing to sort of work from that type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. What's your response to that? I know we've chatted before about, sort of especially financially, like long term. Um, but what's your response to people that say, you know, it's only a, a finite thing and you've got to you've got to settle down one day? Yeah, you gotta you gotta grow up or settle down or find yeah. a little a little place, the white picket fence. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, you know, I guess it's it's as finite as you make it. Um, you know, it can it can just be, you know, a one off travel adventure and it might be a great time for you and you you've loved it and it's you know, it's, it's always going to be a great time, but it might not be, you know, long-term travel is definitely not for everyone. I can say that, you know, it's mm -hmm. it sometimes it has its pros and cons as all things do. But I guess the fact that, um, you know, as with anything in life, there has to be, you know, a little bit of give and a little bit of take. And, and one of the things with travel, I guess, as well as if you do it for a lot of the year is it, it costs you money. It's, it's not free. You can do it very cheaply. But you know it's going to cost you money, so I guess it it depends on what you are, uh, what you really want to do. And you know I've come back from from travel and had fifty cents to my name and had to <laughs> pretty much pick up from pick up from the start. And but you just you do what you have to do. You get a job. Find a way. Yeah. yeah, you get a job. You go straight in. And in in my terms, I start saving for the next adventure. But you know you can always you can always pick up wherever you left off if that's if if money's the big problem. But mm. you know it's just yeah it just depends what you want to devote your your time to i guess yeah you you mentioned something there and and this yeah this whole thing about like you mentioned uh, traveling for cheap um we'll get into that now but that's also one of the things you kind of teach uh, if you want to use that word on your blog um yeah. but 
you mentioned it's definitely not for everyone. Um, if someone's listening to this and they're wondering, you know, should they give it a try? Um, how, how do you think they know? Is it just a case of literally giving it a try and, and seeing if they like it? Or how do people go about deciding that? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's one of those ones where, you know, you sort of have to jump in the deep end a little bit and see, you know, see if you, see if you can swim or if you want to, you know, go back to the, the part where you can, where you can, uh, you can stand. But uh, it depends. So, you know, not all type of, not all traveling has to be done in hostels and, and, you know, and roughing it along the way. You know, you can do more of the, the flash packing, you know, as we, mm. we like to call it or, you know, more luxury yeah. travel. And, you know, travel can be, it can be anything to anyone. It can be interstate. It can be across the road. It can be on the other side of the world. So I definitely recommend to everyone to at least, you know, get outside their comfort zone. And, you know, if you always travel luxury or you always fly first class, if you're lucky enough, um, you know, to, to have a go at the other side because you get that much more of um, – you get a different experience doing different, mm-hmm. you know, different types of travel. So you might get – even though you might be roughing it and, and staying in, in a guest house instead of a hotel, you'll realize that you, you gain that much more of a um, – perspective on on how people live their lives and you know you develop a relationship with with the person who who's offering you their house and their room mm. and, and their food and you know inviting you into their family so that's definitely something i find that you won't get from you know the sort of the generic hotel experience when you're actually immersed in the in the culture and the people yeah. and the and the food and everything like that but yeah, as, yeah for, as for doing it yeah it's just sorry mate what were you saying yeah i was gonna say um like I definitely found, so two things on what you said there. One, I think there's a brilliant book called Vagabonding by Rolf Potts where Mm -hmm. it describes not just a way to travel but a way to to go about everyday life as well. Um, But but also uh, what you were saying about um, the culture and immersing yourself, I found it, and I don't know if you'll agree with this, I think so, but um, I found that way easier and my travel's way more enriching when I traveled on my own compared to when I traveled with a group because you're forced to to meet other people, to meet the, your hosts um, and just get that little bit more out of your comfort zone. So yeah, I'm, exactly. It's it's either if you, you know, I, I recommend people at least try traveling solo because it does do exactly that. You can either, it takes you out of your comfort zone because you can either be the guy sitting in the corner by himself, not talking to anybody, or <laughs> you have to get up and, you know, go say good day and, and uh, introduce yourself and then, you know, swap some stories with other travelers there. And, you know, who knows, you could end up spending the next two weeks, two months, however long with these guys and, you know, building up a really good friendship and relationship with them. So, yeah, it's, it definitely forces you to, uh, to do things that you probably wouldn't if you're in a small group group or even with one or two other people yeah and it's, it's uh you you kind of experience more and you you learn cooler things to do when you uh, sort of interacting with other travelers rather than just reading a book on what you should see and do yeah exactly right <laughs> exactly right. getting outside the guidebook it's you know the guidebooks are fantastic but there's there's also a whole lot of other stuff yeah. out there it's like a tourist versus a traveler it's two very different very different yes things. true definitely um Something that just popped into my head that I'd love to get your opinion on and for listeners as well is um, a couple of my friends often take advantage of these sort of package deals. You know, it's like it's really cheap for a week in Thailand or whatever. What's your opinion on those versus either winging it or just planning on your own in advance? Yeah, you mean like sort of the Kentucky sort of tour trips yeah, versus yeah. The, yeah. So Kentucky or, or even just, you know, you get like those – Sort of one week sort of package, deals, package like yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that um, you know, I think they're they're fantastic if you press for time and you know you want to see a dozen of the the best sites as as quick as as quick as you can, you know. And you don't want to think, you don't want to do anything. You just want to get on your plane, rock up, have the food, accommodation sorted, everything like that. They're they're fantastic and they do certainly have a place. They're they're not my favorite way of traveling because. You know, you're not on your own schedule. You're running on the on the bus driver and the, the tour group leader's schedule. So, you know, that does sort of take away from it if you want to spend three hours at a place instead of just the 45 minutes allocated to it. So yeah. I think that, um, you know, they have, they have their place, but, you know, getting out there and actually being creative and finding your own way around and sort of roughing it a little bit and, and um you know, making your own. It's always good to have a bit of a backbone plan. I think. You know, mm. coming. To, I'm not just going to rock up to Sri Lanka and and you know know nothing about it or sort of have a brief you know itinerary of the things I'd like to see. But you know, having the the ability to stay longer in one place or go with somebody else to the the north instead of the south or if it's raining, go here instead of just what's 
what's set in stone. I think it's it's a lot more of um a lot more sort of freer way to travel. Yeah, I remember when I was um, when I went to Cambodia, I'd only planned to do uh, Sim Reap and Angkor Wat and then Phnom Penh. Um, and once I got there, people said to me, you know, you you can't leave Cambodia unless you've gone to Koh Rong. And yeah. uh, that, that turned out to be one of the highlights of my trip, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been, um, this tiny remote island off of, uh, off of Cambodia, um, which yeah, wouldn't exactly. have happened. I mean, I didn't even know the place existed. So, yeah, it's those type of interactions with other travelers that you, know, you don't really get if you just buy a package deal. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the whole wake up, you know, when someone sets your whole schedule for the day, you know, wake up at 6.30, breakfast by quarter to seven <laughs> on the bus by 7.30 and then drive for four hours and then one hour at this spot and get back on the bus. You know, it's, it's as I said, it's more like a, like a production service of travel, if you will, where you get on the conveyor belt and they just take you from A to B instead yeah. of sort of finding your own way around. Yeah. Um, so we spoke earlier about you can travel for cheap, which a lot of people mm-hmm. probably don't don't believe. But um, I'm wondering if you could share some tips of how you've managed to keep going for ten month, uh, ten years, sorry, on the road. Um, in terms of how you save before you go travel, how you pay for you know, your living expenses while you're traveling. Um, just if you could share some some money tips. Yeah, mate, definitely. So. Um... You know, with the 10 years travel, I've, you know, I haven't been 10 years continuously traveling. You know, I've always had, I yeah, wish yeah. I could have, but, you know, we always got to put money in the bank. So I've, I've done, you know, pretty much every job under the sun. I've been a, <laughs> uh, a, a dishwasher, which we aptly named the, uh, an underwater porcelain technician to give myself a little bit of class. And, um, you know, I've, I've cleaned gardens, clean beds, done everything like that, worked in, um, uh, worked in um, telemarketing and everything like that. And it didn't at the start of my sort of traveling days, if you will. It, I didn't really care what I did. I just wanted to make money. So, you know, that's always a, a viability. Is just travel, work when you have to work, and you know, figure out the rest later on. But um, you know, you can certainly do so many other things. Even um, even while you're traveling, you know, you can um, you can uh, get a working holiday visa. That's what I've done a lot. I've done four years of that in Canada, one in Denmark, and that's basically just. Um, the same sort of thing. You can you can choose a country you want to travel in, and you know work for six months, travel for six months, and um, that's that's one great option. It's it's something you can do up until 31 in most countries, I think. So definitely a brilliant one. Um, and then also like volunteer packages, you might not get paid for a lot of them. Or there's also woofing. I'm pretty sure you've heard of that. So that's basically yeah, working, working on your uh, yeah, working exactly working yeah. for your um your roof and board and, and food. Sometimes you get a small wage, but that's a really good option. And that's, that's a really good opportunity actually to get into the um, more of the, the rustic parts of the, of the country as well. You know, you might, be, you might be on a farm for three months or four months and, you know, you're out of the big cities. You might be driving tractors, you're picking fruit or, you know, anything like that. You can do a million things under the sun. So it's a good way mm-hmm. to also get another, um, get another perspective on the country that you're going to be in. Um, and then, you know, then there's the – the World Wide Web, you know, you can do pretty much anything these days online, and that's you know that's a big focus of, of definitely uh, mine and and your you know your yeah. our futures and careers. So, you know, what what have you done? Indeed. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So you know you can um, we're both personal trainers. We train people online as well. Uh, you can yeah. do that. You can do consulting work. You can do anything. Basically, anything you can do. You can. There's a way to make it be creative and put it online, and you know, build a client base or or build, um, uh, you know, anything from there. So that's that's another one as well. And then uh, working in hostels, I've done plenty of that. Managed a bar in Peru, which is fantastic if you can handle the the intake of alcohol managing a bar. But <laughs> it's um, you know, you don't have, obviously have to work in the bar. You can you can do anything. You can clean the beds, yeah. and that's it's just ways to e- extend your travel. You know, you're not going to make a whole lot of money doing that, but you know, if it gives you an extra month or two traveling, if that's what you're after, then it's, you know, it's a fantastic way to, to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it, man. All right. So I want to get on to a really cool part of this interview. Um, and let your, let your mind expand and go wild. Yeah. Let's hear some of the best places you've ever been, some of the craziest things you've ever done and some of the biggest lessons you've learned as a direct result of traveling. <laughs> yeah, sure. All right. How long we got? Um, all right. Well, <laughs> well, let's some... let's let's say this. So, the one sort of the, the top place you've ever been, and then yeah. maybe like one to three of the craziest things you've done 
and then also like one to three lessons. Cool. All righty. So, oh, putting just the number one for the, the best place. Oh, I no. <laughs> but, um, you know, I've definitely got some favorites and, you know, every country has their, their parts that I love. But um, I've got to say that uh, Guatemala and Nicaragua certainly have a, a special spot in my, in my oh. heart. I've been back to, back to them two or three times. And it's just, once again, it's the people that really, really makes it. They're just the most caring and generous and, and, and giving people for, for a lot of people that don't really have a whole lot and sometimes very, very small. You know, they give everything and more. And so that really stood out. Plus, you know, the, the country itself, it's so diverse. You know, you've got the mountains, you've got the surf, you've got the, the, the desert parts, you've got the jungle and, you know, the islands in the Caribbean on the Pacific on the other side. So they're both fantastic countries that I would say would be, would be up there. Um, for landscape and pure just amazing scenery is, uh, is Norway. Norway, I was there earlier this year and that just blew my mind in the, on the west coast in the fjords and... Um, you know, to wake up every morning and look outside and just see these giants above you of mountains with snow caps coming down and not to mention the Norwegian people who are probably the happiest, <laughs> the happiest people on earth, just cross country skiing everywhere and coming over okay. to say hi and eating their oranges and their quick lunches. It was, it was really, really fantastic place. So that's, um, yeah, I think they'd have to be some of my, my favorite countries for sure. Cool. Uh, one to three of the craziest right. things you've ever done. One to three of the craziest things I've ever done. Um, oh, all righty. What do I think here? Um, I think up the top would be I, – I, I'm just going to say one, one to three in no particular order because they're all, they're cool. all fantastic. But um, hiking to Machu Picchu with, uh, with my mate – uh, Southo, Matt Sutherland in in Peru was fantastic. We didn't do the we didn't we opted out of the the tourist trap of the, the Inca Trail and we went to um, one called Salcante Salcante Trek. So it's about 84 kilometers. It's more arduous than the Inca Trail, a little bit longer, and also goes over a, a high elevation. If I'm uh, if I'm not mistaken, about 4,600 meters above sea level. And we actually did that. It took us four days to get there. But we did it. Um, we did it guideless. We didn't. We didn't want to take a guide. We sort of wanted to wing it ourselves. So we actually had. Um, we had no maps. We had one iPhone with limited battery. And what we do is we had a handwritten notes of to where we should turn and and go. What? And, yeah. And uh, so that was that was great. We'd get to a spot, and if we were lost, we'd quickly turn the iPhone on and and try scroll through um, some of those notes and see you know where we were, what we should do. And we we sort of put it down to. Uh, um, when in doubt, go up the trek instead of down when we got to a, a Y. And we'd always try to avoid water. That was pretty much the only thing. If it looked muddy on one way, then we'd go the other side. And, you know, it was a, it was a fantastic experience and sometimes pretty hairy when we just – we hadn't seen anybody else for, you know, five or six hours and it was getting late in the afternoon and it was, um, you know, rock, paper, yeah. scissors sometimes if we should go left or right. And I think the first night we camped at 4,200 meters above sea level and um, it was pretty pretty hard going and I'd, I'd been working in Peru for a month and a half first so I'd sort of acclimatized to the the elevation but but Southo unfortunately had just just come in two days before and we'd had a we'd had a few drinks I think the night before but the elevation just really got him that first night and, and jet actually lag. <laughs> yeah yeah and the jet lag and you know everything else and no he, had, he was actually riding his motorbike from Vancouver down to um, oh. the southern tip of Argentina so he wasn't he wasn't jet lag per se but he was probably he was definitely tired from uh from the long road down but um yeah the first night I think it dropped to minus seven overnight we woke up in the morning and you know, if we there was a few other people camping around us when we uh, when we woke up, and they all had their guides and porters cooking them hot breakfast and getting you know giving everything ready and packing up their tents, and we were there freezing. And I think my my runners had actually frozen stiff overnight outside the tent, and then uh, we actually walked into a little bit of a snowstorm as we crossed the crossed the the, the pass at 4,600. So couldn't really see anything, but it sort of added to the experience to sort of, you know, have the head down walking into the snow with no guide, not really exactly knowing where we were going. But we got there in the end and it was a really brilliant experience. So that's definitely up there for number one. It was quite a long, a long, uh, long dot point, wasn't it? I'll keep the next two short. <laughs> cool. But that's, that was definitely a brilliant experience. Um, swimming with whale sharks uh, off the coast of Honduras, a little island called Utila that I was living on. Uh, that was brilliant. That's you know one of the highlights of my life to be able to get in with these huge, gentle giants of the ocean and just you know be able to cruise along and see them. They just they're so big, 
they're so big. Like, I think the first one was close to probably 13, 14 meters long. And they, I think we saw six, six in the hour that were out there on our um, surface interval in between a dive. So that was okay. number two, I'd say was up there for sure. Was, was swimming with, uh, with whale sharks. And, um, oh, let me think, right. Number three, um, you know what? I think today was up there as one of the, one of the best experiences, that's for sure, it was being out there with the elephants and, you know, seeing them in there, you know, this wasn't a, this wasn't a, a sanctuary where the elephants are, you know, yeah. brought in and tamed and, and, you know, in some of those horrible places where they're chained up. This was actually like out there in the, in the wetlands, seeing the elephants and the, the mums and the dads and the little, the little baby elephants pulling on the tails was, um, yeah. you know, it was fantastic to see them, to see them in their element and their environment and have them just, just cruising around and, you know, not even worrying about us, just, eating the grass and cruising and, and just chilling out like elephants do. It was really fantastic. So, yeah, oh, I think I'll put amazing, that down man. as number three, mate. Oh, con- congrats. <laughs> Good Thank first dance yeah. in Anchor. <laughs> yeah, a fantastic day, mate. All right, fantastic. Let's, let's just stick to maybe the biggest lesson you've learned from your travels. Uh, all righty. Biggest lesson I've learned would be um, is pretty much, you know, this might sound a little bit generic, is just – is you know, maybe a, a different version of not judging a book by its cover, or or not having a a closed mind to to pretty much anything. Because you know, you, once you get out there and travel and, and meet the different people and see the different cultures and see the different ways of life, you just you get so much of a better understanding of just the way the world works and mm-hmm. and a, a perspective on 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 just you know how beautiful people really are. So, I think that that's probably the biggest lesson I learned from when I first headed off is. You know, instead of thinking everything in Australia is right and the way we do it's the best way, and you know, to actually get out there and, and experience the world and the, the different laws and the different the different uh, you know aspects of life that you might not be exposed to in your home country, I think is that's the biggest lesson I've learned. It's just to be always open to every opportunity and and um, you know, don't take anything for granted. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you, man. And that and uh, people are inherently good. That's yeah, then they are. You know, there's all this. You know, especially now with what's happened, you know, all over yeah. the world, especially in Paris, you know, there's, you know, there's so much negativity around. You've probably heard this on a million different talks and shows and everything, but there is, you know, people are inherently good, and, you know, not every single person outside of your hometown wants to steal your money and take your bag and, you know, kick you off the bus. They're they're actually you know, pretty nice people, and they're they're very very nice actually, and they're very willing to help you out and and show you their their world. Yeah. Now, Dan, I've. I want to be mindful of the time. I've got one final question I want to ask. But before sure, before I get into that, um, you're obviously working on the Lifestyle Empire, your blog, which I'll link to in the show notes. Um, if people want to find out more or get hold of you, how is the best way to do that? Yeah, the best way, mate, is uh, um, either just uh, go through the contact section on the um, the lifestyleempire.com or you can shoot me an email at uh, Dane Bergman at uh, thelifestyleempire.com as well, and I reply to them uh, pretty frequently. So if you want to get in touch with me through that way, otherwise Facebook page, uh, the Lifestyle Empire as well. I'm always I'm always on the social media, as you know. So yeah. it's always uh, probably the most convenient way to get me would be through uh, through the Facebook page, and if not, then the the email, mate. Cool. I'll link to all that in the show notes. Uh, so Dane, before the final question, I just want to acknowledge you for. You know, living living a life so true to yourself and not really worrying about what other people think, but just um, just rocking your own journey. Um, and yeah, man, you, you're an inspiration for me, and I'm sure you'll be an inspiration for the listeners. So thanks a lot for that. Um, Thank you, mate. That really means a lot. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, no worries. Uh, the final question is, which I ask all the guests, is what one small action can listeners take this week to start optimizing their lives? One small action they can take, uh, optimize your life. Okay, um, I'm going to put that can down. Be, that can be like optimizing your life could even relate to, you know, living your purpose, uh, any of that stuff. Yep, yep. I'm going to put it down to uh, uh, three minutes when you go to bed, before you go to sleep or when you just first get into bed, lay there, take three minutes and just – just clear your mind, call it meditation, if you will, uh, you know, mindfulness, whatever. But I like to just take three minutes, clear your mind, think about, um, you know, what you're grateful for, what you appreciate in your, in your life and what's already there, you know, instead of constantly searching as we should do, you know, look, you know, look for the better things, but also just take three minutes and, and kick back and maybe smile to yourself and just think of everything good that's, uh, that's around you and that's already in your life and that you're grateful and appreciative for. I think that'll, uh, help pretty much anybody move forward in, in their life. 
I love it, man. I love it. Dane, thanks so much for coming on the show. And uh, yeah, take care of yourself over there in Sri Lanka. No worries, Brian. Thank you very much for having me, mate. I really appreciate it. And you're doing a fantastic thing. I love the show and I'm going to be tuning in every week. Thanks a lot, bud. No worries, mate. Thank you. See you later. All right, guys, there you have it. As I said before, super inspiring interview with Dane. Such a cool guy. And I urge you to go check out his blog, The Lifestyle Empire. He's doing some very cool things. And um, you know, follow him on Facebook and send him an email if you want to. All those details will be in the show notes, which you guys can find along with all the links and resources we mentioned in this episode. If you go to bryantier.com slash 001, that's bryantier.com, B-R-Y-A-N, T-E-A-R-E dot com slash zero zero one and if you enjoyed this episode shoot me a tweet at Brian Tier. let me know what your biggest takeaways were uh, if you're planning on traveling yourself anything like that and finally feel free to share it around with your friends um, so that they can benefit from it too and I'd love it if you enjoyed this episode to leave a rating and review on iTunes it's super simple you can find that in the show notes too but just helps the show reach more people get the message out there and i'd be extremely grateful all right guys till next time keep well and keep rocking that quarter life comeback